So this is um, a lot of citrus. Now, oranges don't do well in San Francisco because it's never really hot enough. Lemons and limes are good. Tomatoes, you can't get the big tomatoes because you need a lot of heat to get them to ripen, but you can get the little ones yeah. to ripen. I experiment, like if the ginger is not happy here, it needs to be warmer. Mm -hmm. These are dragon fruit, they're growing, they're doing fine, but they really need more heat than we have in San Francisco. Then again, string beans, apples, pears, grapes. I planted a whole bunch of stuff last year just to see what would happen. The whole point of this roof is that we're actually on the garage of my neighbor's buildings. So I live next door, right? Yep. Well, what was it before? Just, just tar paper. There was nothing. Nobody was doing anything with it. So I know the people who live in this building well enough that I said, well, we could put some potted plants and we can get some inexpensive secondhand furniture. This is $200 worth of secondhand furniture. And little by little, I tended it. And I, I, I put more plants and I got some rugs. And partly, it's just an outdoor space that we can enjoy. And on the other hand, I love growing things. It's not like we're going to feed ourselves off of tar paper roofs in the city, but it, it goes back to my great-grandfather. He came over from Sicily. He grew gaguza on the fire escape in Brooklyn. Gaguza is like a giant cucumber or zucchini, and it'll grow anywhere. And he grew vegetables on the fire escape in Brooklyn. So it's attractive. It's teaching me better how to grow things. And it's just a, a nice place to be. And it didn't cost very much. It's just like cheap secondhand plastic buckets and some fabric bags and some potting soil. And I put up the, the, the lattice on the walls. And these walls, they're not my walls. These are the neighbor's walls. Like there's none of this belongs to me. But I colonized it and nobody stopped me. This is um, an arbutalon. This is like a Chinese lantern arbutalon. But it's kind of sweet. The other thing is like, okay, so no money, right? Not, not even my building, not even my land. My neighbors indulged me where I sort of, and I did it in steps. First, a couple little potted plants, just a couple, and then a couple more, and then the lattice went on up, and I even have some string lights here in the evening, so it kind of creates a little evening canopy. And then like a plastic rug, I'm not a huge fan of plastic grass, but it's better than tar paper. So because I'm Sicilian, we, ha we were big on artichokes, and then I was gonna eat them, but then I realized that like, I just love the flowers, right? So it's a thistle. A couple blocks from here, there's a, a community garden. I put my name on the, the waiting list and it took 11 and a half years before a tiny little vegetable bed was available to me. Then there were all these rules. And I'm like, really? I waited 11 and a half years for a garden bed smaller than my mattress and now you're telling me I can't grow tomatoes or cucumbers or eggplants? And I thought, no, this is better. This is the beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission approach. And, and all the neighbors in both buildings, they kind of use it and they enjoy it. My secret superpower is connecting people to each other. Are you three okay here? Yeah. Uh, entertain yourselves. And I mean, see, see right there? That's my kitchen. So we're not far away. Uh, I'm not particularly smart. I don't have any technical skills. But I'm the nexus for all the odd bits and bobs in the neighborhood. All right, so let's go. That's kind of actually how I wound up buying my building collectively with a group of friends. Oh, I love Rico. How okay. big is your place? 700 square feet. So I actually, there's an interesting story about how I wound up here. Okay, so this apartment in San Francisco is one bedroom, 700 square feet. And it was built on a very small lot. In this neighborhood, we're in the Mission District. We were the outer, outer, outer suburb of, of its time. We were really far from downtown and there were no paved streets, there was no infrastructure, and they just carved up lots. And people didn't have 30-year government-backed mortgages back then. So what you do is you'd buy the lot, the vacant land, and you'd build the thing that you could afford to build on a cash basis, or you had a short-term loan with a balloon payment or whatever. And so what happened in this particular case, which is very common in our neighborhood, is that there was a back cottage that was built first. And then, about 20 years later, they built the building that we're in now, which is a four-unit apartment building. And partly what we did here, this is one way that you got a living room in the daytime and a, an extra bedroom at night, and it pivots, and there's a mattress, and then it folds down, it takes up the space, 
which you know, notice that we don't have a coffee table or anything. And we don't sleep here, but we do have guests. But um, we could get two people to sleep here in the living room, and then you can close the kitchen door and you can close the corridor door and you'd have privacy at night. And then in the morning you wake up and you put things back together and it's a living room again. We had to make choices. We could have a couch or we could have a piano, but we couldn't have both. We went with a piano. And you know, we have different chairs and it works, it's fine. We very often have dozens of people over for dinner and we pull up chairs and you eat off your knees on plates and it works just fine. Never ever seen either of my two except like in the far, far distance. Okay, so when you moved to San Francisco, could you afford housing? No. So the story about how we wound up living here is that I had a group of friends. We were a lot younger and a lot poorer. Uncured. Um, mm -hmm. And the scenario... Oh, I can show you the, uh, the mirror image. I call this the separated at birth tour. My neighbor's apartment is on the other side of the wall and it's the mirror image. So you have to imagine that these apartments started out the same and then they diverged because different people live in them and they were modified in different ways. So, so it's, the, it's the mirror image apartment but it looks different because a different person lives here. This is Sam's apartment, he's our neighbor, he's our friend. He's lived here as long as we've lived in our apartment. When I first moved to San Francisco, which was 20 years ago, I could live here and work at a nonprofit. I can't do it. I mean, I even worked at a nonprofit when I qualified for this mortgage, which is amazing. Yeah, okay. Where? That's a Woo! Yeah. No. The story is that we were a lot younger and a lot poorer. It was a long time ago. And the city was cheaper. 20 or 30 years ago, but it was still expensive for us. I am a housekeeper and a house painter and a gardener and a, I don't make any money, but I like what I do. I was working for the landlord and his wife, and I also worked for a lot of the people who were renting from this because they owned this as a rental unit. And I knew from just kitchen talk that the landlord and his wife were thinking about selling the building. But I also knew that of the tenants who were living here, that three of them were thinking about moving soon. So I, I, was, I, in, I injected myself into that conversation and as the old tenants moved out, I got my friends and I to move in as renters. And he has the same Murphy bed. The, every apartment here has one. In fact, most of the apartments in the city, in this part of the city, had those Murphy beds because it was a century-old workaround. And these, yeah. these skylights are... Because the buildings physically touch in the city, they're all packed together, there's no space between the row houses, we have light wells. And the light wells just had tar paper in them, and they generally faced the light well of the neighboring building. He's created a garden here and I liked it so much that I recreated a light well in, in mine. He salvaged this lantern from a, an Art Deco movie theater and at night this glows. He, he electrified Aww. it. So what you have here is like something that's about the size of a small bathroom that if you put plants and you think about, you know, it can become a feature instead of just a thing for ventilation. Yeah. And again, it's one of those century old workarounds. Like electricity was fairly new. You, you didn't necessarily have a lot of mechanical ventilation, and it just let natural light and, and air come into the center of, of an apartment in these row buildings in the city. So that's that. If it was yours, it would come back. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't And then once we were all here, and it took about a year, we approached the landlord, who's a, a great guy, and we negotiated the sale so that he could sell to us and he didn't have to evict anybody. He didn't have to pay a commission for a real estate agent. It was easy. I had the units appraised as though they were condominiums, which came up with a price. And then I offered the units to the tenants at 25% off the appraised price as condos. Sarah spoke it my way. Of course, I wasn't selling them condos. I was selling them tenancy in common and we would have to work together, so my tenants essentially would become my partners in a tenancy in common that we would eventually convert to condos. I just, yes. My friends We wound up buying the building collectively. Now, there were some complications because 
as young people with not a lot of money buying a fairly expensive building because it's a four unit building and a fifth cottage in the back. This was real money. Back then it was, it was real money. No bank would give us a mortgage. Partly because it was a five unit building which was called non-conforming. Like they're used to single family homes. That's what the banking system is arranged for. Good. <laughs> and they weren't gonna give us a loan. Plus, you know, we, they didn't really feel like we were the kinds of people that could carry that kind of a, a mortgage. So we worked a pro forma. We created a different kind of presentation to different banks. And we said, we're investors. We're gonna be slumlords. And we know that this building will cash flow based on the debt and the rent that's gonna come in to service the loan. They said, oh yeah, absolutely. Their, their attitude changed completely when they realized that we were just looking to, to make a cash flowing investment. And they said the numbers definitely worked out. And then we just continued to rent to ourselves. You see how that worked? So we were slumlords for ourselves in the building we were living in. And that's how we went, and we're all still here. No. So you would never have been able to get a loan for a personal home for no. five people living together. The banking sort of system is not set up for that. The uh, banks yeah. were like, no, we're not doing that. But the same exact people with the same exact amount of money and the same credit rating showed up and said, we want to be slumlords. They're like, great, let's do that. Banks definitely know how to get a cash flowing rental property to work. Yeah, oh, so this is my light bulb, right? So it's not like, a, was that the doorbell? No, was. Oh, no. was it? Yeah. What? Hey, hey. Johnny will come get you. I'm going to come down. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. Rango wants to help. Rango's we dog. purchased our units collectively as a tenancy in common. And then there's a long lottery process and waiting process you have to go through for the city, which took 11 years. Yeah. It's getting a little bit chilly. You can hang out in my apartment if you want. After you win a lottery, then there's a next, the city approves you to become a condo. And there's a long process after that of things you need to change with the building and paperwork and legal documents which must be completed in order to become a condo itself. So the whole thing from the beginning to end was about a 14 year process. Yeah, you can stay in here and keep warm. And if you need anything, you know, this is a house, you know where all the things are, look in the kitchen, you'll find it. some books, yeah. All right, so this is my light well. Now remember, it's like, it's, it's the size of a small bathroom. It's not a lot of space. But I put a little deck down, which isn't even nailed down, it just rests on top of the tar paper. And I put some potted plants there and some hanging baskets. And it's also my neighbor's light well on the other side of the property line. And I just gradually expanded and colonized <laughs> both of them and uh, nobody said anything and i'm like all right and then we, we actually know each other really well i've got keys to their building so this is the door to my neighbor's building a long time ago i noticed that as i was taking the rubbish bins out of my building that the woman who does the rubbish bins here was getting older it was becoming more of a chore for her so i volunteered to start doing it for her and at first she said no, she said no, you know, she could take care of it. But at a certain point, it actually was a lot of work. And I just passively began to take out the rubbish bins for her. And along the way, I got a key to the building. From there, there were other things that people in the building asked me to do. Like they would be out of town and they would need somebody to get into the building and I would have a key and I'd let them in. There was a problem with plumbing. I could come in and I could sort of troubleshoot it, turn off the water supply, that kind of thing. And part of this, this whole process was about creating an environment in which people were comfortable asking me for things and in which I could sort of experiment on other people's property with things that they might not have said yes to if I had asked, but they sort of realized it's kind of nice once I actually go ahead and do it. And back here, there's this garden. If you're a tenant, in a building where you basically get along with the other tenants and you think you can't afford to buy a place, by all means, get your ducks in a row, go to a mortgage broker, and lay out your case. In San Francisco, the legal form of this is called tenancy in common. Anywhere else, you would be a real estate development partnership and you would approach a bank to say, we're a real estate development partnership, we want to buy this building, and you could get a mortgage. As far as buying a place with people, the key to it is to 
hopefully have a good group of people you bought with and just you, being flexible and understanding of the people because you're living in these tight quarters. You're relatively close to your neighbors, so it's just finding a way to get along with them. Is that the new one or is that this new one? Yeah. Oh, so you, you get like-minded people with like-minded goals and you, you find a way. I came from not very good stock. I mean, it was, there was a lot going on when I was a kid. We didn't have money. It was a struggle. And what I realized is there's different forms of capital. There's the cash, which is really nice if you have it. I didn't have that. Uh, the bread is really good. There's the hippie, vegan, whatever thing. I think you've had half of that already. So what I realized is that if you take enough individual people and you can form a collective goal and you can all chip in, you can actually achieve more than you could as an individual. And that's really not a very American ethos. Everyone wants to be like, pioneer man, you know, well, I'm going to go into the forest and I'm going, you know, and I'm like, no, that's not, was, that, that was never going to work for me because I just, I started out with not too much. Or it used to be Marie's house and Marie passed away just before the COVID situation. But uh, she was my friend for many, many years. She was a flight attendant. More often than not, I'm the guy in the neighborhood that people reach out to when they have a little problem or they need something tinkered with. I don't always know exactly how to fix what's wrong, but I usually know the person who can do it. I'm always the guy that shows up with a mop and uh, is there to help them paint and... I enjoy being that person in the neighborhood. All these little connections, they don't seem like a big deal. But over time, they accumulate. And it's that informal network that I find is incredibly useful in life for everybody. And the joke, this has been going on for years, is that if you need a job, an apartment, uh, a, some furniture, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, just keep coming to my apartment, just keep coming and sitting at the kitchen table at lunch and dinner, and sooner or later you're going to find what you need by whoever else is sitting next to you at that table. Everybody has a skill, everybody has the ability to get something done, everyone has a certain connection to something. These are the workers, they're doing their business. That's the stuff that has really allowed me, you know, with very modest means and, and uh, not a lot of resources personally, to, to make my way through life. By being of service to other people, usually helps me get what I need, eventually. It's not a, a direct connection. You can't always connect the dots specifically. Okay, I've officially been stung and they're not liking me very much. But that attitude, okay. that way of living in the world has served me very well. They're not bothering you? No, not yet. Not yet. You can see it coming though, can't you? 